Welcome to Change the Narrative. I'm your host, J.D. Fuller, an African-American, licensed psychotherapist, professor, diversity coach, consultant, and author. We talk about the isms. We talk about the phobias, anything that marginalizes and oppresses. Everything we are not and everything we are is because of fear. Through a mental health lens, we'll have difficult conversations with celebrity guests, political activists, and everyone in between. Our mind will tell us whatever we want to believe, but the truth lives in the body, and that's where change occurs. Are you ready to change the narrative? All right, Samantha Hawkins, welcome to Change the Narrative. Oh, amazing to be here. I tell you what, I am honored to even be a guest. So thank you so much for having me. Oh, absolutely. (laughs) My pleasure. So I always like to get a little bit in the background to kind of frame and locate what we're going to be talking about. And I'll get to the book very shortly. But I want to know, what type of child were you, right? Because it tells a lot about us, what kind of child we were. Wow. So I was homeschooled, and that probably speaks loud enough right there and then. <laughs> my, my mother raised uh, three kids. I was about to say three awesome kids, but really, she was the awesome one. We... <laughs> We were, we just uh, took after her and, and my dad was awesome as well. But, you know, moms, they make the home, they make or break the home. So uh, I really am a mama's girl. I was homeschooled and as well as my little sister, my brother was in public school, but we was homeschooled. And the kind of child I was, was I was always a reader, avid reader, always loved. I, I laugh about it and I tell people that one of the biggest things I used to get in trouble for was my mom would say, she had a rule, real simple rule. We had bookshelves of books. You could read any book you want, but you do not fall asleep with books in the bed. Wow. Well, when I was growing up, yes. And because my mom was like, it's going to crease it, it's going to dog. It was so simple. You can read up. And then when you're going to bed, you put that book up, go to sleep. Well, we had bunk beds, my sister and I, when we were younger. So sure enough, my mom would come in our bed, our bedroom and she'd, you know, say good morning, girls, whatever. And she'd find books stuffed underneath <laughs> the pillows and the blankets because I was on the top bunk. I'd be too tired, too lazy to put the book up. And I used to have the family dictionary or the, or the, the saurus and she'd be looking for it and she would know. Sam's got it in her bed. I know she does. Got it underneath her pillow because I fell asleep reading the dictionary or something. So. All right. So wait, this goes a couple <laughs> of different directions. That is a very interesting uh, rule out of all the rules to have. But I also want to know, what, what was it like to be homeschooled? I mean, I, I don't really know how to ask that question because I guess it's what you know. Mm. So how it was is how it is. But, but was there anything that stands True. out for you being homeschooled? I credit being homeschooled that it really made me kind of the independent person that I am. And you can grow up, you know, you can have went to a public school and still have that. But with my mom, even though we had a steady curriculum and we, you know, there was obviously subjects we needed to know, it allowed us to, to learn certain things that we wouldn't have learned, you know, just every day in a school system. So it allowed us to be able to kind of bring our own things into it and tailor it to what the type of person we were. So because I was always into writing and creative writing, my mom would set apart days or she would, and she would set apart days. And it was like, okay, Tuesday, I'm not going to have you just, you know, it's math all day. No, Tuesday, you're going to do a little something. You, you want to create a write, you want to write poetry or whatever, you want to read a poetry, you know, we grew up listening to Maya Angelou, you can listen to Maya Angelou and, and that can be your, your day. Uh, you're going to, you're going to come up, you know, at the end of it, write an essay or something on what you learned, you know, it's going to connect it because it's a learning experience, but it allowed us to really grow into who we were. Mm. And now as an adult, you know, peer pressure is one of the biggest things in schools. It was big then and it's still big now. And that's for anyone. It's it's definitely I mean for people like us, you know, peer peer pressure for us in our skin, not feeling comfortable because we don't check off boxes that other people want us to check. 
So now as an adult, because of how I grew up and being homeschooled and kind of being used to growing and being comfortable in my own skin, I am a real settled and confident adult. And there's nothing someone can say to me just about or bring to me that's going to, you know, shake me or, or make me think, you know, think low of myself. Mm -hmm. So I credit that to kind of what my mom instilled in us, the fact that we were homeschooled and saying that, you know, we're going to, you're going to have this different type of schooling, but you're going to make it your own. And that's just life. Everything is what you make of it. So, you know, I think that one of the things that's really interesting is there's such a stereotype with whole homeschooling, you know, uh, in, in terms of, you know, lack of social skills and not having the dynamics of relationships, which are powerful in the emotional development of kids. Oh. Did that impact you at all? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. There was, like you said, there's always been the stereotype, especially growing up as soon as you, you know, someone... I can remember us being in the library or something, or we'd be in a store and someone would say, shouldn't you be in school? And then, you know, my sister and I were like, well, we're homeschooled. That's why we're here in this library, whatever. This is our field trip. You know, we're here reading books and growing up, you feel different mm -hmm. and you hear things like, and my mother, mother definitely heard things like, well, they're going to grow up with no social skills. They won't know how to communicate with people their own age or anything. Big stereotype, big uh, stigma that surrounds homeschooling, but it, it's a myth. Can you grow up, you know, be homeschooled and not develop social skills? Of course, it's always possible. It, it just depends on what you do. But in our case, if anything, it made us more, not necessarily more social, but it's made us more comfortable in social environments. Mm -hmm. I mean, I work in a field, I work in communications where I literally have to you know, I'm one spoke in a will, so I'm used to being around people and I deal with people on a daily basis. Because of, of that, of having that, you know, being homeschooled, I didn't have to be around people all the time. But when I was around them, I knew how to carry myself. I knew how to talk. And that gave me my confidence. I knew I could articulate a point better than probably another child my own age could. So... I still, we still develop that confidence and you can still be homeschooled, but have those social skills. Oh, that's really helpful. Thank you for dispelling that myth and the stereotype. Now, you know, I was going to ask you this even before I knew you were homeschooled, so it may sound like a setup, but <laughs> is there something that you didn't receive as a child growing up? What, what would you have wanted that you didn't receive as a child growing up? Huh. <sighs> I think I would say um, probably more acceptance of my differences, hmm. my quirks and everything. And I feel like I didn't get that acceptance and as until I grew up and it became clear like I wasn't going to change, <laughs> like those quirks were a part of me. But back then as a child, I was just looked at as different, even in my own home. That it wasn't a source of maybe, it, they didn't directly judge me, but it was clear that it looked at me as different. And I think it shouldn't have taken as long. And sometimes that happens. It didn't, you know, it wasn't until I maybe turned about 16, 17, when it became clear, like, well, maybe it's not quirks. Maybe this is just her, her personality. Okay. But when you're growing up, all those years, it was quirks. It was uh, Sam's just eccentric. <laughs> so I think for every kid, every kid needs to get that acceptance early because sometimes you don't get it early as an adult. It, 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 it doesn't matter. You will have already have this built up in your head that something's wrong with me. Something's wrong with me. Thankfully, by the time I did get that acceptance from my family about just those little things that I was just different or I processed things different. My my brain worked different. Um, by the time I got that acceptance, I wasn't so far off thinking that something's wrong with me. But if for some kids, if they don't get that early on, they now they become adults who think something's wrong with them. Yeah. And it's not them. It's them, but it's nothing wrong. It's just who they are. And everyone needs to be accepted just because 
your brain processes something different the way someone else's brain processes something. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. So now, when did you start writing and, and, and why? I mean, you sort of alluded to that, but you've always been a reader, you've always been a writer, but when did it become a real thing for you? So as a child, I used to write poems. They were bad poems, <laughs> but it was, it was born from my mom just pretty much saying, I mean, we was never, you couldn't watch television all day. You had to do something. And the worst thing you could say to, to, our, to our parents was, I'm bored. There's no, I have nothing to do. Those were the worst things to say. Because they would be like, well, I'll give you something to do. <laughs> so we found something to do. And for me, it was just writing. Writing was the way I expressed myself. I, I realized that it was my power. Before I really found my actual voice, I had a voice in just writing something down. I'm having a sad day, so I'm going to write about it. I'm having a happy day, so I'd write about it. Little journal writings, journal entries that eventually evolves into poems, bad poems at 8, 9, 10, 13 years old. And then, and then I started writing a little more sophisticated poetry, I guess, still just for the realm of my family. I, I would write poems in greeting cards and so people came to expect it. They knew, oh, for my birthday... Sam's going to write a poem like they just knew. Oh, Christmas. He's going to write a poem for every member of the family, something for them. And then I had these aspirations of I'm going to be a writer. I remember one time I was like 13 years old. Someone asked me, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, I'm a writer. And they said, OK, what, what do you want to write? And I looked back at them blankly and they looked back at me and I'm thinking, I want to write everything. <laughs> you want me to narrow one thing? I want to write everything. Oddly enough, I have written almost about everything. Like I have, I have published songs. I've written poetry. I've published essays, op-eds, stories. It's just certain things I come back to. So when I started freelancing, it wasn't you know a full time thing. I, I had my full time job in customer service, but I started just freelancing, writing personal essays for MadamNoir.com. And I would just write little things about lifestyle, started out little personal things about me, you know, things that I felt might connect with other people. And I thought, oh, this is, this is pretty good. So I did that for a while. And then I ended up coming across an article uh, that was jarring to me. And I thought for the first time in my life, I'm going to write a children's book. I'd never felt inspired ever to write a children's book. I was totally okay with writing personal essays. I had been published in a chicken soup for the soul book. The first one I ever did, it was the, the, the edition where it was the first time there was all black women authors. Wow. Four black women authors by black women authors. So that was the first time I was published in a chicken soup for the soul book. And, and I have another story coming out in the second one uh, this, this month actually, but I was perfectly okay with writing essays. And then came across an article in The Guardian, and it said, in a nutshell, it was like two years old, and it said that in the UK, the children's book market was so lacking of books that featured leading characters that were black, brown, represented minority ethnic groups. It was so lacking that the average kid could walk into a bookseller, pick up a book, a children's book, and it was they were more likely to see the face of an animal staring back at them than someone that looked like them that had the color of their skin. And I said, well, heck, I believe God has given me this gift to write. I'm going to use it for, for real good. And if I can write one book and put a book out there that can positively impact a kid in the UK, I'm going to do it. And it took me an afternoon. <laughs> I wrote my book. So let me, let me, I'm going to get to the book, but I also want to talk about when do you think it is a good, when yes. do you think it is a good age mm -hmm. for children to learn about the importance of activism or to learn about abolition? Ma'am, there is no, there is no good answer for that because the answer is there is no, 
you know, like minimum, eight, they can start as soon as you start reading them books, mm -hmm. they can start learning. Obviously, at, you know, they're super young. They're not going to understand it. Sure. But the whole point and the goal, my goal as a writer is to put that message out there that you can never be too young to practice activism. You know, activism isn't this grand thing. We think that, you know, well, when you grow up, you can do it. Well, you can do it in the school. You can do it young. Obviously, you can't, you're not going out there with picket signs and, and, and necessarily marching. But it starts as small as I see someone being mistreated. Why are they being picked on? I don't understand that. Uh-uh, you shouldn't be being picked on. Standing up for someone who needs it. That's, that's the beginnings of activism. And so the point to me is that any kid, any age can start learning about it. We don't have to wait till you're 12 or you're 13 and now we'll talk about it. Plant the seeds early is what I believe. Plant it early. Yeah, I, I agree with you completely. I think it's, I think it's uh, you know, there was an incident in the school and one of the things that I, I'd said to the kids is, you know, instead of doing this TikTok thing you've seen, how about you think about how to make a change somewhere or something? And I'm not against social media, kids in social media, whatever, it's their thing. But the fact that they're taking mm -hmm. all of their lessons from social media, good and bad, is problematic and they're not doing anything about it to change it. And these are young kids, you know? And so oh I, I like God. what you're saying because the idea of, of putting some action behind what you're doing does make sense. And I think it's important. Genuine awareness. It's true. I mean, every every Black History Month, this is what we see. You see TikTok, you see videos, and it's supposed to be like, oh, look at this, you know. And the kids, this is not awareness. This isn't, they're not truly learning, you know. I, I saw recently this this one where, you know, you have the kids on, on like, you know, African-American kids and some other kids, they were like, climbing on the backs and and it's supposed to be like a statement of message for black history month like oh look you know we're gonna let you do this because that's not that's not what we're looking for that's not true change that's not true change and that's that's certainly if we're if we want our kids to know what actual change is then we need to be putting out literature books to let them know because otherwise they're going to learn from TikToks. Yeah. That's what they're going to see and think that's oh okay that's what awareness is. That's what diversity is. That's what inclusion is. That's not inclusion. Yeah. I so, agree. I agree with you 100%. It's, it's yeah. And that that's actually mm -hmm. the challenge I was talking about this whole idea of reparations by, you know, making white kids do stuff for you. Yeah. I mean, how misinformed <laughs> are you if you think that's going to oh, cure 400 plus years of pain and racial racial trauma that's not that's not going to do it and it's not going to do it because it's the month of february yeah that's exactly what i was talking so about. right okay <laughs> let's uh let's shift gears and talk about what was the catalyst like was there a specific catalyst or was it just sort of an evolution to get to the book uh, my mommy marches so basically after i read the the guardian article i started thinking about well what kind of book could i put out there and even though it's, it's published in both the U.S. and the U.K., I knew that it had to be in the U.K. because that was where the article. We have a lot of books. Thankfully, in, in the U.S., we have a lot of books that is now talking about inclusion and diversity. This is overdue. And honestly, we can keep putting books out there because there's never going to be too many books. I, I once heard someone use the term like it was oh, our market is oversaturated. That's the wrong term. It's not oversaturated not because we can never have enough books to make our kids aware of these issues and to teach them how to deal with it. So I started thinking about what type of book did I want to write? And I thought, well, what is needful, especially for a black or brown child to see? It had to be something to do with social justice. So the concept to me was, what could a child understand? even a young child reading this book. Well, maybe they don't understand big words like protests and boycott, but every kid understands marching. They can, every kid knows the act of marching, left, right, up, down. So imagining, which is as in the book, this, this little girl 
It's like looking out her window, observing her mother marching for social justice. Why is mommy marching? Why is she doing that? To make the world a better place. And in the book, I didn't tie, I didn't tie it to any single issue because I didn't want anyone to get hung up on that. I wanted it to, to be something that parents could use to introduce their kids to standing up for what you believe in, because there's so many issues as a platform that you can use and you can say to march for this, to speak up for this, to stand up for this. And marching is one term, but obviously I would hope parents take it and say, maybe you're marching for justice, maybe you're writing letters for justice, maybe you're standing out side speaking up for justice, but marching is the term that I used. And so that was really the, the concept for the book. And I, it turns out the one publisher that I wanted is who I got, Lantana Publishing, who is UK based, UK based. And that is their mission. They're all about these kind of books, raising cultural awareness and raising, you know, a fuss about issues that need to be important and art is important for all of us, you know, because it's everybody's fight. That's the problem. Everyone thinks that it's that group's fight. Oh, it's one group's fight. It's all of our fight, or it should be all of our fight. Yeah, and it, and it's a different kind of fight, right? I mean, for each group, it's a different kind mm -hmm. of fight, but it's absolutely it is. a fight. It should be, it, ideally, it's a fight for all of us, even if it takes shape and morphs in different ways. What I like about uh, marching, you know, it could be a metaphor, like you said, um, but but there is an action. Yes. There's an action behind it. And so I love that, yes. that metaphor is that it's, it's real streamlined. Whether you're marching, like you said, or writing or whatever, you're doing something. You're not just sitting around talking about it. And that's what I think is really powerful and important. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in terms of like, um, I guess I want to think about the character of the child, right? The child at the center of the story. Yes. How, how would you characterize this child? That's what I'm thinking of. So in my mind, I, I imagined her and, and it actually kind of plays into probably what the, the next book that, that I'm working on is I imagined her as being uh, biracial, thinking about my own nieces and nephew, African-American and Hispanic coming from, you know, these two worlds and coming from these two worlds, but her mom being African-American as she is depicted in, in the book, very much the basis is she's, when she grows up, she's gonna be a black woman. You know, mm -hmm. that's how it is. She's a black woman. She's a black woman. Um, but, I, but when I worked with the amazing illustrator, Corey Reed, on this book, that was how I, I kind of asked because I knew the second book that I was working on, it kind of would connect with her father. But uh, with that, the, the mother is the one who's marching. She's, she's a black woman. And, you know, in the book, it says something like, this is something that, you know, my mom says she does it because her mom did it and her mom's mom did it. And they did it before that. And it's all, it's, again, it's just putting feet to your beliefs. It's, you can't fight every battle with words and the battle of, inju of injustice injustice to one is injustice to all mm -hmm. because if it's not affecting you now you think it's not affecting you now it will affect you later that's why that is one fight that is that's singular that we all need to fight because against one group it affects all of us but um but yeah so that's how and so th it's this young curious little girl to her that this is a new world. She's looking out there. She's seeing her mom does doing it. And she's just asking the question of why, Oh, to turn, you know, the frowns and, you know, into smiles to make the world better, to make the world safer, to, to make sure that no one in the world is ever unhappy again. That's why mommy marches. That's why I want to march. Just your average child there. I like the idea of the, uh, the legacy factor, you know, her mom did it. The mom before her did it. I think that's really cool. And the other piece is that, you know, although it's a brown child, in reality, this is every child's book. I mean, the idea yes. of, of the fact that, you know, I am my brother's keeper. That's that's what I, I wholeheartedly believe. You know, we have to care for each other. Oh, yes. And and the idea that 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 
by taking a position and doing something that's active, it, it impacts everybody in a positive way. And by not taking action, it impacts everyone in a negative way. So again, you know, kudos for putting that all together. I think it's really, really streamlined nicely and it makes sense and it's, it's helpful for every child to see. So I think that's great. Um, yes. You said this was a passion project. So, you know, I think I know the answer, but I still want you to give it. Why, why was this a passion project for you? Because to me, it will be the greatest thing I've ever written. Wow. You know, the freelancing and, and writing op-eds, writing for the Atlanta Journal, writing all that, that was all part of, okay, I, you know, I enjoy writing and I get paid for that. But this, you know, you do something, you get paid, but every once in a while you come across a project where it's like, it just makes you want to set everything down all of a sudden. Any other project I had, I didn't care about putting a song out. I didn't care about doing anything. I just cared about this so much. And that's what it, it, it just, this is a gift. This is me gifting something to the world. At the end of the, at the, end of the day, just to, to have this book out there, to be able to, which is to give copies. I mean, I, I've got my author's copies and I already, already got lined up to give to people. I've, I've told some people, they don't, you know, not saying y'all don't buy the book, but <laughs> you know, I tell some folks like, don't buy the book because I'm, <laughs> I'm get, you know, this is a this is my gift. It's me giving back. It's it's more so me giving back than anything. So I'm proud to do this, but I don't look at myself like I'm like it's I'm doing anything fantastic. I just see it as this project, this mission chose me to be the person to put this out in the world. So I'm more so honored to get to, to, to have been a part of this and, and putting this, this book out there. Well, I think you got to do a little bit more hype. It is fantastic. It's amazing. And it's wonderful. And everybody should buy it for a kid they know. Let's just change that narrative right there. Um, and, and as you said, any kid, you know, there's a line in, 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 the, in the book where she says that mommy marches for people that look like us and people who don't look like us great That's any great. kid this can resonate with so you know this is going to be a long sentence and then a question um <laughs> now that white supremacy has taken shape in a variety of different ways including using woke mm -hmm. as the uh replacement for blackness voter suppression and the book ban most recently mm. and that's just naming a few right mm -hmm. What do you think are the yes. priorities moving forward to keep changing the narrative? I think the biggest thing is we have to create our own in everything. We've tried so long to assimilate and say, well, we'll create our own within this. Well, we'll have our peace within this pie. We need to create our own. We, this, we are, there's, too many talented, amazing activists, everything, people in this, look at you, who, who is in this industry, we can put all of our talents together and not go to them and say, here's all of our talents, here's all of our gifts, let us offer this to you, and you can make, no, put all our talents together and do our own thing. Stop fitting, feeling like we have to fit what we have into this industry. Carve out our own piece, not our own piece of the pie, our own pie. Uh -huh. And I think that's the biggest thing. We need our own, our own space. Stop trying to get a seat at the table that doesn't want us there. Build our own table. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yes, ma'am. Before I have you tell everybody where they can find you, I'm just going to you know, it, you made me think of one of the award shows this week. I don't watch any of those award shows because they're all hype and they're never about us. They're not our awards. That's what I always hashtag, not our awards. You know, to think about mm -hmm. Beyonce being overlooked for this album Renaissance is crazy. It's just, that's enough said. It's just yes. crazy. It's just such a statement of white supremacy. There's nothing else to say. The most incredible album that she's done, as far as I'm concerned. Yes. And And so the idea that we can still be overlooked no matter how many tables we sit at. 
no matter how great our work is, should be a lesson to people. No matter our title, our ranks, our position, how much money we how have. Much money. And they will they will celebrate us just as long and they will say, Hey, look at you with all your all your stuff, all your awards, all your trophies, and we can still be overlooked. Yeah. When it matters the most. Yeah, because it's always white supremacy is such that it's always a way to remind us of our place. There's that's the ultimate goal of white supremacy, to remind us that we are not in charge. And so whatever way we have to do that, mm-hmm. it'll be done. And and I don't mean to minimize our struggle by an album. But it's such a metaphor for what we see repeatedly. You know, a book ban, how many black authors and authors from the global majority are getting, you know, ditched because of a book ban? It's so intentional and so calculated. It's true. A lot of booksellers where, you know, authors are, you know, will will post about how my why is my book not in in a Barnes and Nobles? Why is it not here? Why is it not? Why why is it being banned? Why is awareness being banned? Why is raising a fuss and making noise about social issues that should be important to everyone being banned? And that's just, yes, you can rise so far, but you can't rise that far underneath that regime. Yeah, absolutely. That's it. Absolutely. And that, you know, it sounds like that this um, this book, this writing, it sounds like it's really been cathartic for you in a form of mental health. And I'm always about mental health. Has it been that for you? It has. It, it really has. I, I said how when growing up, how before I found my actual voice, how writing was my voice. Well, now I have found a voice, a literal voice, but writing is still an extension of that voice because there are crowds where you can't raise that voice as loud as you want, but you can't stop the power of the pen. The Mm. pen is still mighty. And that I will I will continue to write my heart out and lay it bare in verse. That's a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful place to end, Sam. Um, thank you so much for coming on today. I've really enjoyed getting to know you, your story, and hear more about your writing and what's behind it. Please tell everyone where they can find you on social media, your website, your book, when they can buy it, and so forth. Yes, ma'am. So My Mummy Marches, published in the UK. My Mommy Marches, published in the US. Well, coming out to the US, um, March, uh, March 7th, available on Amazon.com. Barnes and Nobles, basically any bookseller you want. And you can find me at my Instagram handle of Forever Telling Tales, Forever Telling Tales. That's T-A-L-E-S. And thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you for all you do and for truly changing the narrative in every way. So appreciate you. Thank you, sis. Uh, we will catch up again because there's more tales for you to tell on, on the show. And, I, and I'd love to have you back. Thank you so much. Take care of yourself. Okay. All right. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks.